Uh, and uh, my name is Dr. Joe Servan. I'll be moderating uh, for tonight's discussion. Just as a reminder what we're trying to accomplish, uh, basically the genesis of uh, these evening sessions actually started, believe it or not, in the, the most healthy of places at an IHOP uh, in ASU Tempe campus when I used to meet uh, with uh, Professor uh, Ed Sylvester who did science uh, journalism and reporting uh, for ASU. And this was, I'm talking about probably year 2002, 2003 or so. And uh, we always, uh, in our conversations, uh, always wanted to, to get a sense that somehow we felt that at least when it comes to uh, science and health reporting, uh, we, we always felt that there was like a, a difference between the perceptions of physicians, health professionals, and reporters, even though we're all trying to do the same thing, which is serve the public good. And this is one of those times that we thought that one of the things that I hope, and, and he's unfortunately passed away, was that if we could get everyone together in one room, or at least attempt to, I wonder what we learn from each other uh, as it comes to various topics. So I want to, number one, acknowledge uh, Professor Sylvester as uh, he passed away a year or two ago, and also uh, Dean Chris Callahan for being kind enough uh, for uh, helping to support this pilot. Tonight we're going to be focusing on the opioid epidemic and Cronkite School has been amazing in its reporting of that epidemic. Uh, they, if, if most of you probably saw the uh, wonderful piece they did, the documentary, the second one on From Prescription to Addiction that aired recently uh, on literally every station uh, in Arizona. Very impressive feat. So we're kind of continuing that in our small way here on the opioid epidemic and kind of taking us to see what are the perspectives on this issue. Joining me tonight, I have uh, from the LA Times, and she's gonna be our media expert, uh, and that is uh, Harriet Ryan. Uh, Harriet is an investigative reporter for the LA Times. She's been with them since 2008, a graduate of Columbia University, and uh, has also been doing brilliant work uh, reporting on a number of issues for the LA Times, everything from the Catholic Church to the Kabbalah Center, but. Those aren't the topics for tonight. Uh, tonight uh, we're going to be uh, talking on something that she has done a lot of recent investigative reporting and that is uh, the role of Purdue Pharma and other pharmaceutical companies uh, in the role of the epidemic. And so Harry, it's a pleasure to have you here tonight. I'm glad to be here, thank you. And we also have our medical expert, Dr. Christopher Wee. He's assistant professor of anesthesia uh, at Mayo Clinic. He's also director of the pain rehabilitative uh, program uh, at uh, Mayo Clinic here in Arizona. So Chris, it's also great to have you here as well. Thank you. Let's uh, set the stage and uh, we have a little bit of a video montage of the point is this, to really look not so much at the content of opioid epidemic, but look how, how is it being reported and how is it being covered? So we have a video of, of broadcast news, radio news pertaining to the topic to set the stage. So why don't we kind of roll with that at the moment. Prescriptions for narcotic painkillers have surged in recent years. Abuse of the drugs, including fatal overdoses, has risen too. Doctors and patients are grappling with how to balance the need for pain relief with the potential for trouble. From the CDC today, a nationwide health alert. The country, it says, is in the midst of an epidemic of painkiller abuse. We're back now with what the Centers for Disease Control calls a growing epidemic of prescription painkiller abuse in America. More than two million Americans abuse or are dependent on prescription opioids. Almost 60% of Americans who take opioid painkillers combine them with other prescription medication. Research shows exposure to opioids during pregnancy can increase the risk of birth defects. 
people who will sometimes crush these things and snort them, take them in a way that they shouldn't be taking them, and that adds to the potential danger as well. So we're a country that takes a lot of pain pills. We take 80% of the world's pain pills in this country. We, the U.S. The United States. Painkillers are very addictive. They are opioid medications, and it has the same chemical properties in it as heroin. This is the quietest epidemic, drug epidemic or drug scourge we've ever had in this country, certainly in the last 50, 60 years. Tell me the effects. I go to the pharmacy right now in the real world, you get pamphlets, you know, you get a bag of information. They sit down with you and tell you, look, take this, but at the same time, be careful of this. Here are the side effects highlighted. Every NFL team I played for knew that. They also knew that a guy who had asthma shouldn't be taking Toradol. Did I know that? Hell no. The director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention this week sharply criticized doctors for prescribing powerful narcotic drugs to treat patients with chronic aches and pains, overlooking options like physical therapy and exercise. It was the risk of acetaminophen overdose that led the FDA panel of experts to recommend eliminating prescription painkillers that include it. New guidelines released by the CDC are designed to decrease the number of people abusing the drugs. Now the CDC is urging doctors doctors to reconsider whether the opiates they prescribe are really necessary. You have to see your doctor before you get the prescription. So there's going to be a much stricter sort of enforcement of this. They have a number of different approaches, everything from limiting the quantity of pills that providers can prescribe um, to requiring providers to uh, register for a prescription drug monitoring program. In order to save lives and prevent all of the accidents and crime and heartache that, that follows opioid overdose or intoxication, we're going to mandate it. This just has to be done. There are 12 recommendations from the CDC. Among them are non-opioid treatment. And maybe the rest of the country will pick this up, Ainsley, and we'll see a fight against opioids. As you can tell, uh, the way that uh, it gets covered, uh, at least uh, in, in some of those snippets from broadcast media, tends to have a very, uh, you know, a, a, a certain element of, of medical physician blame and, and victim and abuser and things of that sort. And we're going to explore that type of narrative uh, in a moment, but let's kind of uh, advance to the first of the slides, and I have kind of like just one of these fact checks in terms of uh, what we see for the opioid crisis, and you can kind of read them there, but it's basically and how many patients that you see uh, that with non-cancer pain that are prescribed uh, those opioids. You see since 1999, the sales of prescription opioids in the U.S. have quadrupled up to one out of four people. Uh, recover, uh, you can read it for yourselves uh, at this point that the statistics are fairly uh, powerful and potent. And I guess the first question that I would have, uh, you know, Harriet, when you look at uh, those statistics, um, is this in your reporting, and I know you've done this extensively, uh, is, this, is this also bearing out that, because those numbers look very sobering, but is it, are those numbers bearing out in what you're seeing on a, a, in, in your various investigations that you've looked at in terms of this issue? I can't see the statistics that you're referencing, but the, the increase in prescribing has been accompanied by an increase in overdoses, emergency room visits, uh, treatment admissions. They're all, they're all in an upswing. Um, when it comes to prescription opioids, we know that um, in some ways they have dipped uh, in recent years, but there's been an uptick in heroin that sort of replaced um, whatever gains were being made with uh, prescription opioid abuse. So yeah, I mean, those, those charts that are basically like this, right. they, they're consistent, yeah. Christopher, in your practice, uh, the numbers that you see, are they jiving uh, with reality? I mean, those, they look 
when you see all these numbers just jumping dramatically, is this what you're seeing in, in the pain rehab program based on your practice? Sure, there's a lot of patients that are on <clears throat> opioid medications and have been on them for you know quite some time, right? And I always talk about the pendulum kind of swifting back and forth, right? So probably the mid-90s, right? Purdue Pharma, uh, pain is the fifth vital sign. Really, we gotta treat everybody's pain. And if you don't, you're gonna be a bad physician. And even as far as we're not gonna reimburse you as much, right? And so in that case, everyone was prescribing the opioids, just almost you know, giving them out. I wouldn't say not giving them out like candy, but just really giving them out a lot, right? And then you had a lot of this uh, pharmaceutical push of you know, these are safe. Trust me, you, no one's gonna be addicted. You'll be fine, just give them the medications. And you know, then I think we're, we're in the wake of that, right? And so now I think this, sometimes the pendulum can swift all the way back to the other direction where now there are some providers that um, are even unwilling to give any pain medications, even for appropriate patients, appropriate indications. So um, obviously, maybe there's perhaps a happy medium somewhere in between. Um, the optimist in me thinks that you know we're, this is going to tend to get better. Will it go away? I don't think so. The problem is, um, you know, pain medications, they do work. We do prescribe them for legitimate reasons, and sometimes it's impossible to predict who exactly will, you know, become addicted. We have some risk tools available, but of course those aren't, those aren't perfect. I appreciate that. I, let, let me kind of, uh, let, let me start kind of uh, bringing up uh, other voices, if you will, uh, into the conversation. And what, I, what I've done is I've tried to get a mass various perspectives from uh, various folks. And uh, why don't we advance to, to the next uh, slide, because uh, uh, our own uh, Surgeon General, uh, Vivek, Dr. Vivek Murtha, uh, had basically, uh, I reached out uh, to their office and they, they kindly uh, provided uh, information uh, in terms of uh, this particular evening in this conversation. So if we could advance to the next uh, slide, that would be great. Um, there we go. As he, as he pointed out to me, this is uh, quoted from, he sent this from his interview with the Boston Globe. He goes, recently I met a man in Phoenix who told me that being diagnosed with cancer had made him happy. And how could that be, I asked him. He told me having cancer meant he would likely need surgery, which in turn uh, would mean more prescriptions for the pain pills to which he had become addicted. He had started using prescription painkillers when he was young. Over the years, addiction hijacked his brain, compromising his health, altering his reasoning, and leaving broken relationships and altered dreams in its wake. Now, Dr. Murthy, uh, when he sent this, he wanted to point out, hey, see, I, I mentioned something in Phoenix, which is not the happiest thing to, to bring up about our state. But he had the Surgeon General's office released uh, a fairly lengthy report uh, on the opioid epidemic uh, that is, uh, is amazing in terms of being a very complete compendium of information. And I guess my, my first question, um, Harriet, is when, when those reports come out from the Institute of Medicine or the Surgeon General's office, I know they tend to be summaries of issues that are happening, but how, as a journalist, do, are, are they must read? Do they get covered? Uh, how, how do they impact the coverage, if, if at all, when those reports come out? For, for several years, starting in, in the late 2000s, there was research that showed that there was a insufficient evidence, I should say, that uh, opioids were appropriate treatment or effective treatment for non-cancer chronic pain. And these were studies done by uh, researchers like Jane Ballantyne, University of Washington, a bunch of other people. But they largely stayed within the scientific community. There was an NIH white paper, a similar topic, Again, very much insular inside the, the research community. When the, when the CDC came out last March with the guidelines, that was a sea change. The guidelines were for how primary care physicians should treat patients who had chronic pain and not cancer. And they were, the guidelines were written in very simple um, language and they were very clear to physicians what CDC, which many of us believe the best and brightest in, in medicine, believe was the appropriate use of opioids. And what they did was they discouraged 
doctors from treating chronic pain with opioids. And they also said that, you know, here are certain levels that people are on that we think are not advised, are dangerous, are risky. And the Surgeon General you just mentioned, he was able to reduce these guidelines to sort of like a handout. And he, he sent one to every doctor in, in America, every primary care physician, you know, saying you should familiarize yourselves with these. I want you to sign a pledge to read these, know these, understand the science behind them. And I think that whereas other research sort of stayed within the scientific community, within uh, addiction researchers and, and, and that um, community, the CDC guidelines have really crossed over into, um, definitely into the medical world, down to the primary care level, but also uh, with reporters, um, we're able to have in one place all an analysis of all the research that's been done by a, a federal agency saying, you know, we've looked at this, the people that review this material don't have significant pharmaceutical company ties, and so they're, they have clean hands to some degree. Um, and this is what we think doctors should be doing. As a reporter, once you have that, then when a drug company or law enforcement or you know the DEA says something about opioids, you have something to hold it up against and say, okay, well, here's what our leading public health authority says about that. And so I think it's been it's been powerful and it has informed the conversation about the prescribing of opioids and, and how appropriate that is in this country to the extent that they're prescribed. Um, and you can actually, you know, don't take my word for it, but you can see it in the sales figures for uh, prescription opioids in this country. I know OxyContin between, we had sales figures for the first nine months of this year, and they, there was a significant decline this year. And since 2011, they've fallen by 40%. So I think, I think you're really seeing a broader audience um, understand some of the concerns that specialists in this field, in addiction and, and um, opioids, have about the wide use of these drugs. Chris, what do you think? Uh, when these reports come out, um, are these something that, at least here's a specific one and you mentioned, and Harriet mentioned the CDC guidelines. Do they trickle down into just general practice or, uh, or at least from what you're seeing from other physicians? Yeah, so anytime there's a guideline that, that comes out, there's always, right, there's always good that comes out of it and there's always bad, right? So there's patients that, you know, I guess I'll start with what's the good about it. Well, it gives us some backing of patients as well. How come you don't want me to take you know, how come you're not taking me to higher doses of pain medications? You have now the CDC, the federal government, kind of backing you and saying, no, you know, this isn't, this is what we consider low dose, moderate dose, or high dose. So in that respect, it's great. And I, I agree with a lot of the uh, parts of the guidelines. Um, and it really, it gives us a little bit of some standardization, right? Because, you know, I could name, you know, some practitioners, even here locally in the Valley, that are just known for high dose opioid prescribing, right? I'm not gonna comment on their practices, I don't see their patients, I don't know the specifics of that, but there are practitioners out there that are just more comfortable or they just you know, prescribe a lot of pain medicines at high doses. So hopefully these guidelines will kind of bring everybody a little bit closer together, right? And, and kind of cut out some of these outliers. Um, so then on the negative side, what we've seen a lot too is now primary care physicians are just saying, I don't want to deal with this. Like, I don't want to like do any of this. I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, not prescribe any pain medications, even for patients that were using them responsibly at a stable, non-escalating, low dose. And then all of a sudden, they're, I'm not gonna prescribe. You're gonna have to find somebody else, and then just take them off completely, right? Uh, so there's obviously some patients that kind of get stuck in that mix, and I've seen um, several of those patients come through, um, and it's almost, some of these, I think, primary care doctors are thinking, oh, this CDC, this is almost like a witch hunt. If I don't get my patients down off this medication, they're going to take away my license. I'm not going to you know, be able to practice, and obviously that's not the goal of it. But uh, there are some physicians or practitioners out there that are just now um, unwilling to even prescribe medication, so potentially patients that may benefit from this type of therapy. And of course, we all understand that opioids are not first-line therapy for treating chronic pain. Um, and so sometimes if you tried all and failed all these different treatments, that's kind of all that you have left. 
Um, so there's, the, there's good and bad, right? No, that, that's a, always a helpful perspective when it comes to any of these issues. Let me kind of go to the next uh, uh, slide if we could. Um, this comes from two colleagues, uh, from uh, Dr. Joe Draskowski, a neurologist, and Dr. Greg Meyer, a uh, palliative uh, care uh, physician and surgeon. Uh, Dr. Draskowski wrote, the current opioid drugs, uh, if they were up by, for approval by the FDA today with their track record of killing 16,000 Americans per year and addicting countless others, would these drugs be approved? And then Dr. Meyer, as he put down, uh, much of the coverage has been superficial and, so, and focused solely upon the physician's role in creating the opioid epidemic. What about direct patient marketing and other roles? So, Harry, Harry I'm going to start off with you. you have, you're clearly the expert. You've done these uh, wonderful pieces on Purdue Pharma. So you've gotten all these perspectives. Uh, if you were going to do a pie chart and you know, divide accountability, because really these questions are asking, how did we get here? Patient, doctor, FDA, and pharma. How would you, you know, how, how in your opinion as you get the, the, the top of the world look, would you divvy that up and for the accountability of how we got here? Luckily there's enough blame to go around. Everyone will get their share. Um, no, I mean, it's a good question and I, I, I'm sensitive to the idea that uh, doctors are called on the carpet about this and, and I can imagine what that feels like to, you know, especially if you're in solo practice and you're making these decisions and you're seeing somebody every five minutes, every eight minutes, if you're lucky, of course, like you, you, you don't want to be blamed for this. Um, that said, there are the, a lot of the prescription drug epidemic, the, the street dealing, the really horrible situations where you know gangs have been moving drugs, where you can buy a pill for a certain amount of money. If you trace those back to their source, it's not a doctor who has been misled or conned by a patient. There were many physicians that were working for drug dealers. I mean, criminal doctors. They got prosecuted in federal court for trafficking controlled substances. These were not just people who made a couple innocent mistakes. And my father-in-law is a doctor who I've had many arguments with on this topic, and I, I want to separate people that are trying to make really good decisions in a short period of time and aren't, you know, don't uh, purport to be able to read people's minds. I want to separate those good doctors from people who, you know, really just like went off the reservation, betrayed their oath, were criminals, whether they were prosecuted or not, and they were committing crimes. So. Um, I think if you are a good doctor and you are very conscientious, you also have to make yourself aware of uh, there were these, you know, handful and people of people in any community who were really fueling the black market for drugs. Um, the CDC has said this is a doctor-driven crisis, and when they've said that, they're not talking specifically about those, you know, bad actors or criminals uh, who are working with criminals. They're talking about the fact that prescriptions that doctors are giving to people um, are up to up to 24 percent of those people who are taking it long term are becoming addicted and and once you're addicted there's a lot of problems and death overdose um, and abuse so that's that's the role of doctors you know but there's also the pharmaceutical industry we wrote a series of investigations uh, last year about purdue pharma that raised questions about their um how they contributed to the prescription drug epidemic from just the comp very composition of oxycontin uh, whether it lasts a true duration, um, and then what they did about when they had evidence that doctors were trafficking their drugs or participating in trafficking their drugs. So, I mean, I, I invite you all to read our series, latimes.com backslash OxyContin, and see the issues we've raised about the pharmaceutical industry. And then, of course, we have individual patients. I mean, we have people that are responsible as well. There's personal responsibility at, at every level. And you mentioned the FDA. Um, I think the question of whether any of these drugs would be approved now is a really good one. Um, and we have one branch of the federal government, the CDC, saying there's insufficient evidence these drugs are appropriate long-term treatment for chronic pain. The FDA has approved all these drugs. So it's like two parts of the federal government are arguing with each other to one, uh, to one uh, extent or another. But. Um, I, I guess I, I directed some of my comments to, I know you, you're dealing with a lot of physicians and I think there's a sensitivity there and I just want to um, ask physicians who are conscientious and trying to do the best for their patients to open your mind to the fact that there were many people and there are many people out here 
um, who are not doing that. One drug company that we wrote about, Purdue Pharma, a manufacturer of OxyContin, they had a database of 1,800 prescribers that they had evidence were colluding with addicts and drug dealers. Mm -hmm. And just, this was not like a, just anybody could get in that database. They had an investigation process, um, only about half of the people that they investigated actually ended up in that database. This wasn't a couple anecdotal reports of like a bad patient. So that was 1,800 for one drug company. So um, I mean, I understand pride in one's profession, but you also have to open your mind to the idea that some people weren't uh, taking their oath as seriously as you are. No, I appreciate that. Let me, let me kind of go to uh, rush. Uh, to, let me go to the next slide because I think it's it's on this topic, and and it again is a government uh, piece of the equation. And and Chris, you referenced this. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, came from both uh, Dr. Tom Nelson, psychiatrist at Mayo, Dr. Vic Trastic at ASU, former CEO of Mayo Arizona. Uh, a surgeon and a psychiatrist, sort of a, almost of a joke almost, but uh, that came out with the same almost identical point, which was back in the 1990s, there was this uh, element that there needed to be a fifth vital sign, that is patients had to be uh, managed for pain in addition to looking at their other uh, vital signs. Uh, they, they pointed out they felt that that was like one of the biggest contributors to this, almost the law of unintended consequences. The AMA this year uh, came out and basically said they, they're dropping the fifth vital sign, uh, which then brings up the natural question, uh, where do you go when, uh, what does that mean for pain management in a hospital? So let me start with Chris on this one. I'm going to go back to Harriet on the government in a moment. How, when they reverse this and they say, okay, this isn't going to be maybe in a publicly reported setting, what does that mean for pain management uh, in that situation? Because I know you brought this up earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I'm going to allude to something that you said earlier about different government agencies kind of arguing with each other, right? So I think this is an excellent example, right? So you have the Department of Health and Human Services, right? Underneath it, CDC also separately centers, uh, centers for Medicare and Medicaid services, right? So now they're kind of aligning together a little bit better. That's why I have, I think, a little bit of hope, right? So you have on one hand the CDC saying, all right, don't prescribe opioids, it's not good. Now the CMS is saying, uh, we're gonna give hospitals of patients these surveys, HCAP surveys, and a couple of these questions which they're actually gonna drop now. A Couple of them, even the way they're worded, they told the patients, uh, this is not word for word, but did during your hospitalization, was there everything possible was done to, you know, control your pain? And then the, there's four responses. And, you know, the top response is always, right? So to me, that's always hard when the top response is always, right? And so if there's an emphasis from CMS saying, if you don't get good job on the surveys, we're actually going to cut your reimbursement. And then CDC now saying, all right, well, don't prescribe opioids. It's like, well you know, what do we do, right? So that's kind of puts everybody in kind of a diff difficult place, right? So now I think, now we're dropping, you know, this pain is the fifth vital sign. I think, you know, everything's aligning a little bit better, right? And it goes a little bit more about patient expectations, right? So you go in the hospital, you have a surgery. Uh, it's all about patient expectations. Sometimes patients will ex expect that their pain will be a zero out of 10, even after a major surgery throughout their hospitalization and then after into the recovery phase. And, and oftentimes that's just not realistic. So even in not just the acute pain setting, but more with patients suffering from chronic pain, it's just uh, setting realistic expectations, saying, you know, maybe it is not possible for us to completely eliminate your pain. What are some other things we can focus on as far as improving your function, quality of life, uh, things like that. So. Um, I'm an optimist, so I think that some of these changes are, are good, right? Harriet, how, how did you see, uh, in, at least in your reporting, where the law of unintended consequences, and because and, I heard the fifth vital sign come up a lot in uh, prepping for this evening. I mean, where did, where did you see it in terms of how this played out in the larger scheme of things? Sure, I, I mean, Chris is talking about with the late 90s, exactly um, the pressure on doctors to uh, treat their patient pain, uh, to overcome what the drug companies were calling opiophobia. And just, you know, let's get people who have 
sort of common aches and pains that accompany you as you get older, lumbar pain, bad knees, you know, arthritis, let's get people on opioids for these. Um, and, you know, 20 years later, it's like we conducted an experiment involving the entire country and we can tell you what the results are. Uh, I would, the, the last story in our series was about um, the manufacturer of, of OxyContin, the owner of the company going abroad to the developing world in other countries. And it was really, really interesting to see their marketing sitting here now in 2016, 2017, watching their marketing in these countries because it was in some ways going into a time machine um, and going back to the, to the mid and late 90s in the US, th that drug company, so it's called Mundi Pharma abroad, they are sponsoring programs in Brazil to teach nurses and doctors the fifth vital sign. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting given how that has become controversial and now some people turning their backs on it. Um, I think that you can also, uh, an interesting part of this whole debate is, is the racial aspect of it and, and the, um, how it has uh, affected Caucasians more than other races. And there are some people who work in public health who think that cultural expectations um, of how much pain is tolerable played a role in who was prescribed opioids and therefore who became addicted to them. So in Los Angeles, I, we live in a, a very diverse city. We have a very minor opioid problem. And compared with, you know, I mean, I think our death rate is actually lower than it was in 1999, maybe. It's crazy. But when asked for an explanation of that, one of the explanations is that we have a very large Latino population and a very large Asian population. And there's obviously racial discrimination and how people are prescribed different medications and just in healthcare treatment in general. But there is a belief among some in public health in LA that um, Asians have a historic aversion to opiates because of you know the opium wars and just not wanting involvement with narcotics. And that many in the Latino population believe that you know there's a certain amount of uh, pain that goes with life and you just tolerate it and you press on and everybody's you know, has, has their uh, lot in life, and you certainly don't see a doctor about, you know, knee pain. Um, so I, I think that's interesting, just how your expectation of a pain-free life, um, I think is is maybe what in some way played into to where we are now, that that's an unreasonable explanation as we get older. Um, and I think that many doctors, um, if they had someone expecting that, today would say, you know, that's not going to happen. You're going to have to learn to live with it to some degree. Interesting. Let me, let me advance, I think, on, I, I'm going to stay on the point of community. Uh, if we could advance the, uh, one, uh, actually two slides to the one on law enforcement. Uh, I thought this was interesting. I actually got the bureau commander for the SWAT team uh, in Arizona <laughs> to provide some commentary. And let me highlight uh, something that he said because he really wanted to make a point. The most tragic scenario involving the failure, well, he, he obviously has a very strong anti-media anti feeling of the mainstream media uh, with their ability to reach millions of Americans on a daily basis is the uh, fact that teenagers and young adults who often don't comprehend the power of addiction. He makes the point, make no mistake, prescription opioids far too often serve as the real gateway drug particularly as it correlates to the illicit street, uh, street drug use. He goes on to kind of point out, and I'll just say kind of an interesting uh, element. In my experience, one of the best sources of information about youth ad addiction has been uh, the open and informal conversations with kids experiencing addiction on the street. For reasons that I can't explain, heroin addicts tend to be more willing to talk about their plight than users and addicts of other illicit drugs. Another police officer throws in, there's only two groups of people that become, that uh, have this issue. Number one, those who have an injury or surgery related, uh, opioids are highly addictive and easily abused by those who are provided with multiple prescriptions, or those who easily obtain them, younger people, family members, and friends who are commonly exposed to these prescriptions. So I, I thought it was an interesting perspective, a 33 uh, police de Arizona Police Department uh, person and then the SWAT team commander. And I guess, um, Harriet, I, I mean, how do, 
to me, I think it's self-evident, but I'll ask you, know, do you think that gateway drug, I hear it for so many, I, I normally I hear it in the world of cannabis, uh, or at least that's been the argument, but is that really his point well taken in terms of where this has led us in terms of the heroin issue and things of that sort? Absolutely. Uh, we wrote about the effect of black market Oxycontin on a small city in Washington state. And what we were told by people there was that they, this community had had a meth problem in the 90s and they'd responded with aggressive school programs to kids warning them against meth, depicting it as the filthy drug that it is. And those kids who'd grown up on those programs were not gonna try meth, it was effective. But when they saw the pills, they thought of them as relatively safe because they were made by a pharmaceutical company. They, they weren't buying them um, you know, from some schlubby guy, they were getting them from friends. Um, and they thought they were sort of sophisticated and upscale. And those people are addicted to heroin now, or they're dead, or they've been to rehab many, many times. So, uh, you know, the CDC basically acknowledged a part of it as a gateway drug in their guidelines when they called on doctors and, and hospitals to not send people who have surgery or have temporary conditions home with a 30-day supply of opioids. They said, you know, four days, seven days should be sufficient because they don't want those pills and medicine cabinets where curious kids can can try them. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, look, heroin is not a gateway drug for many people. That's uh, intravenous heroin is where you end up. It's not where you start. Um, but pills, they have an attraction to kids. They seem less dangerous. They seem sophisticated and they, they you know, they're not. They're not sophisticated and they're super dangerous. Chris, do you think that the characterization, the two populations by uh, uh, Officer Mitchell, is that right from what you're seeing for the people you deal with? Well, I think I think the big myth is that right. It's, this is a prescription medicine. It's a medication that you know a doctor, a uh, advanced care practitioner has prescribed. So therefore, it must be okay or safe to use, right? So I think there's that that myth, right? And so. Um, I think what we need to do maybe is educate more. I guess obviously we're doing that right now. Um, how dangerous opioids are, right? They're not safe medications, right? If you're used for appropriate reasons, they're okay. And kind of alluding to another point that you know, even though I'm prescribing this opioid to my patient that's using it responsibly, they're not going to abuse it. I always tell my patients that I know you may not be abusing it, but guess what? Your friends, your family members, they can easily abuse it. These are highly sought after medications. You know, the street value of some of these medications are really high. If you calculate <laughs> some of the value of what it's worth in someone that's on a higher dose opioids, you'll kind of be astounded at how much they're actually worth. So even though the patient themselves don't want to abuse it, they're not going to abuse it, maybe somebody else will. So it's always obviously a good idea to keep them in a safe, locked place, right? No, no question about it. Let me kind of advance to, to the next, and this is really kind of hitting to, to the issue of uh, what do we do about it? And I know, Harry, you mentioned it about education, but we had from uh, the president of the School Nurses Association of Arizona, she provided this perspective. Opioid addiction has destroyed many families, our students, and a great deal of pain has been caused that no one wants to talk about. Uh, she points out, and this is really the crux of the question, recently Governor Ducey of Arizona signed a law making the drug naloxone available for schools to use in the event of an opioid overdose. This was a big step acknowledging the problem. So I guess my, my question is, uh, when it comes to uh, placing naloxone uh, or Narcan or whatever the, uh, the, the, uh, the correct name is uh, in, in varying schools, is that, been uh, to what you've been seeing effective, useful. I mean, obviously it could be life-saving, but how, how has that been playing out in terms of uh, in Los Angeles? And, and I'll get Chris's perspective here. Well, the Sheriff's Department in LA is going to try, they're getting funding for every officer uh, to have uh, naloxone. I know in um, Places that the problem is more severe, I'm thinking of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Maryland. Um, people have taken, like, the government officials have gone to great lengths to make sure that any possible person who could ever use naloxone has it. In Baltimore, the health commissioner, who's an emergency room doctor, she wrote a blanket prescription for every person in the city. Anybody can get it anytime they want. 
and they credit that with saving with 800 lives. I mean, I don't know if some of those people are probably the same person more than once, but 800 re uh, re revivals, res resuscitations. I think uh, that's not a solution to the opioid epidemic because you know reviving someone does not get them into treatment. It doesn't make more treatment beds. It doesn't get them a Suboxone prescription. It doesn't help them deal with the underlying issues that uh, led them to become an addict in the, in the first place. But it, it buys that person another day to maybe get to the point where they're going to seek treatment. And um, that's important because often it takes people you know, months, years to get to the place where they are ready to go into recovery and take the steps they need to. And if they die uh, the second week, they have an addiction, they will never get clean. Chris, what about uh, naloxone, like widely available? So I think it's I think it's great. I mean, this now this is going to be the pessimist in me, right? I've been an optimist all this time. So the pessimist in me is saying, all right, if, if it's gotten to that point, we're way too late, right? So now we have to back this up. And I think, um, and we haven't, I haven't mentioned this yet, but right, there's always this talk about the, you know, the opioid epidemic, uh, but there's not much talk about, you know, chronic pain in the millions of Americans, right? So if there was no such thing as chronic pain or pain, you know, out of proportion to what we would, we would expect, then we would, you know, there wouldn't be a role for opioids, and therefore patients may not have access to this, and then, you know, therefore family members may not be able to get addicted. And then, you know, I think naloxone is kind of at the very end to where, yes, it's great, but at that point, it's we gotta maybe go backwards or, or you know, go a lot more, um, you know, to the to the origins of of what's really, you know, creating all this, right? So I think there's a lot of, you know, focus placed on public awareness of, you know, obviously breast cancer and all the diabetes and so forth, which of, of course is great. But I think, you know, chronic pain patients kind of get the shaft a little bit just because, A, it's kind of invisible. Somebody has cancer. Okay, we know what's, what's going on. It's, a, it's the defined problem. Cells in your body are growing when they're not supposed to. But then patients that have chronic pain, you know, sometimes they, you know, family members think, oh, they're just a complainer or they're just weak or they're, they're just not mentally tough to deal with it because, you know, I've had pain before, but I've, you know, sucked it up and, I, you know, I'm okay. <laughs> so I think, you know, there's, what, the last anywhere between 75 and 100 million Americans that are suffering from chronic pain. So I think, you know, that, that has to be part of the, the talk. Anytime you talk about the opioid epidemic, you always have to then talk about, okay, how about, you know, chronic pain treatment uh, in America, right? So I think there's, there's that aspect as well that I think oftentimes gets overlooked. Well, let me kind of advance one more slide because I think it goes right exactly to your point. I had uh, a kindly a list of uh, varying physicians and, and they made a, a lot of points about, okay, so we write new laws, what do we do now with the pain uh, if, if you rule out uh, you know, all these new regu regulations? Uh, what about synthetics? What about the distinction between chronic pain and not cancer versus non-cancer? What about prior authorization process uh, that uh, the approval to get these things utilized? Um, how does that, wh where do you take it from here uh, in terms of the next step? And, and maybe, uh, Harriet, how does that look in terms of being to use uh, uh, Chris's point, optimist or pessimist, but the optimist in terms of solutions for this, in terms of reporting and things of that sort. I mean, it, it's a really big problem. And on top of it, we have now Mexican cartels bringing heroin into this country. And, and you think, well, that has nothing to do with the prescription drug epidemic, but it does, because when people can't get pills anymore, they go on heroin. And while we had an opportunity potentially to control the production of uh, opioid analgesics and their prescribing, we have no ability to control Mexican cartels. And so, um, you know, working, looking at it from a supply side is going to be problematic, you know, because we can't do anything. I mean, I don't know, President Trump would probably say something different, but they're very <laughs> difficult to control. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, Chris is absolutely right. Like, chronic pain is a huge problem. And there was a belief promulgated by the opioid companies and embraced by everybody that opioids were the solution. So we spent 20 years on that to, to get to 2016 and to learn that from the CDC, no, they're not the solution. 
imagine everything that could have gone on in that 20 years in terms of developing um, you know, different types of therapies, um, finding out what works in terms of physical therapy, acupuncture, meditation, um, you know, some people would say cannabis. Uh, so we, we, we spent that 20 years on opioids. But I've heard different people say that there should be a Marshall Project for pain. I know there's research going on about um, trying to, to reconfigure opioids so that they attach to the neurons differently and, and are not as addictive. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a huge problem. And as the, the baby boomers continue to age, it's going to be an even bigger problem. And the I, he, I hear so often from terrified pain patients who really believe that in their specific case, opioids work for them. Um, and they are worried about them take, being taken away from them and they feel under attack. And and what you really hear is just, just how hard it is to be a chronic pain patient, period. But especially at a time when so many people are skeptical of painkillers. And it is a big problem, and I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Chris, I'm going to turn it to you. I mean, where does it take it in research? Uh, you work in pain rehab. Where, where, does, where, where does this issue begin to get settled on a day-by-day, case-by-case basis? Sure. So, and that's right, uh, <laughs> very difficult sure. you know, problem, right? Uh, the problem is that Pain is a good thing, right? I mean, it's there to protect us, right? So for example, acute pain, you fracture your arm, guess what, it's supposed to hurt, why? It's gonna protect you so you don't move it so it allows the body to heal, right? And so there's a mechanism that says, all right, everything's fine, let's shut the pain signal off. Sometimes that doesn't happen. For some reason, the, the wiring system that I say in the, bo- in the body just kind of goes haywire and the body's thinking it's protecting you, but it's the fracture's healed, but the body wants to tell you that this is still broken, you should still experience a lot of pain, right? So that, kind of the, the mechanisms behind that obviously are very, very complex, right? So I think that's very challenging to, to kind of get a drug from, you know, basic science through the animal models, through right. the clinical trials, and then finally available. That's very hard. We do have uh, excellent treatments, but, you know, now we're, you know, I'm gonna make you guys feel all sorry for me is that, you know, we're all (laughs) under constraints by insurance companies, right? A lot of times we all know what the best thing to do for patients are, but guess what? We can't do it because the insurance companies don't wanna pay for it, right? Um, You know, at Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, Arizona, Jacksonville, we have a wonderful program led by Dr. Cynthia Townsend's also in the crowd here. Um, It's a three-week intensive outpatient uh, pain rehabilitation program where we, it's multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary. they're doing occupational therapy, physical therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, biofeedback, uh, just educational sessions, and we actually taper them off all their opioid medications, controlled substances, and patients do fantastic. Well, then what's the problem? Well, you can imagine, you know, multidisciplinary, very intensive three-week, uh, insurance companies are very skeptical about it. They don't want to pay for it, right? Maybe one of the reasons is is that they realize this is just a numbers game. So, you know, patient X, you know, statistically may not even be on our plan next year. So why am I going to invest this, you know, time and you know financial resources on this patient where next year, you know, they're going to just move to another company, right? So we do have programs out there available. It's just. I think from a more logistics standpoint that it's hard to get patients into these treatments, right? So, which, which makes it very, very difficult when you have all these, another party with the, the insurers and all the involved. I wanna give uh, the audience an opportunity to ask uh, Harriet and uh, uh, Dr. Wee uh, questions. And uh, I'm gonna uh, take this, so we have a mic here so that Harriet is able to, uh, to see you. And, and if, uh, I, I, I really would uh, implore at least to kind of extend our conversation here uh, in terms of issues that have uh, kind of come up uh, or questions that you may have with regards to some of those f- uh, fantastic stories that you've seen uh, Harriet's uh, work in the LA Times. If not, as you heard, it's, it's, uh, you can certainly find them easily or uh, with regards to day-to-day practice. So you have uh, questions, or at least to start off, and here we have someone coming up. Hi, my name is Sandy, and um, I wrote all my stuff down because I can't remember everything, but uh, I worked on the, I was a student when I worked on the heroin, tracking heroin's hold in Arizona. And 
We did, I just have a comment and then I have a question. Sure. Um, the comment is about the slide that you put up about the heroin addicts being very willing to speak and we found that to be really true. Um, my personal opinion is because I think they feel that the opiate use is expensive. Um, you know, as far as the prescription drugs become expensive for them and so they try to find cheaper alternatives. And so they find that they're very willing to work or I mean to um, talk to people about their addictions because I kind of think they don't feel guilty in the same way that another drug user does until they realize that they're addicted and then they start having all the problems and then they realize that their drug use actually did start by other gateway drugs such as smoking pot and other types of drugs and that kind of thing. But it's, um, it was really interesting to see how willing they were to speak. Um, my question is along the fifth vital sign and the responsibility on the patient when they go to the hospital. Um, where is your, as a patient, responsibility in that? Because I know for myself personally, I've gone to the ER um, and you go to the ER for a reason, you're in pain or you know something's going on. Mm -hmm. So when they come in and the first thing they say is, okay, well, we're gonna give you a shot of morphine. Here it is. And you're like, no, I don't wanna take that. Right. You know, cause if you don't keep me, I have to drive home. Right. And then I'm on drugs when I'm driving home. I don't wanna do that. So where does, where does, where do you fit in that? Because you, you have to go in and say you're in pain. Otherwise they work with somebody else who really might be in lesser pain, but is willing to take the drugs. So where, how do you get the help that you need without taking the drugs, without making you feel like you should take the drugs so that you can get the help that you need? And it's kind of that vicious circle, uh, if that I, makes no, sense. No, it does make sense. I appreciate it. Uh, maybe I'm gonna start with, uh, uh, with uh, Chris. Wh where do you go with that uh, in terms of uh, the accountability, like you're offered this and here you show up. How, how do, what's your sense, at least, as you hear that? You know, that's always difficult, right? Because, you know, think about, uh, I'm not an emergency medicine physician, but think about what they're, you know, tasked to do or just anyone that's working in the emergency department. You know, lots of patients are coming in. I think a big thing that Harry mentioned was, you know, time constraints too, right? And so they're tasked with seeing, you know, X number of patients and really across the board over the last several years, we're all expected to do more with less, right? So I think that's part of the reason why they may just say, all right, let, you complain of pain, this is the best thing I have for you. Um, but as far as you know, being your own advocate, you know, if you say, hey, listen, um, you know, I don't want that, thank you. Uh, I think this is what may be going on. I'm hurting here. Can I have, you know, more evaluation? You know, no. I mean, the emergency medicine physician may, you know, think you're kind of odd by refusing an opioid, right? But you know, that's you know, be more than you know. Obviously, we always have to fight with the opposite, right? When we say, I don't think you need this uh, medication, the ibuprofen, when the patient then demands it, and then and then it's calling you out. Well, you're the most, uh, you know, the meanest doctor. You're not compassionate. You don't believe me, and right. So usually, it, it's it's that route when you are suspecting of someone coming in um, for just strictly the IV medication, right? Um, but I think. Uh, just you know, being an advocate and saying, hey, you know, I don't necessarily need that. Is there any non-opioid medication? You know, there's plenty of non-opioid medications out there uh, that also they do work well, but sometimes not as well as opiates, right? Um, but I think just you know, a simple um, request, and that would be more than uh, accommodated, right? Harriet, what, uh, uh, what's your sense as you, as you heard uh, the commentary, but kind of the accountability to the patient, someone may demand it, you show up, you're in pain. Uh, what, what have you seen in terms of, I mean, have there been anything in, in reporting that's come up in terms of educational elements or what to do in these situations as it comes to the accountability of the person who shows up in the ER? You know, the most often, the thing I hear most often uh, on that topic is, uh, people years later saying, I had no idea what I was getting into. And I think there's a push by the CDC, by the Surgeon General, to have doctors and patients have a big conversation at the start about what's going on here. And that's not a conversation that's gonna occur in the emergency room in an acute trauma situation where you have a broken bone or you know something that landed you in the emergency room. But definitely there's an increased emphasis on before you put someone on 
opioids for back pain, for knee, for joint pain, something that they're going to be on for a while, to say, you understand these are addictive drugs, you know, you understand this is what the CDC has said about them. Um, and I think that, you know, personal responsibility, there's, it, there's enough for everybody. And yeah, you're going to be the person who is potentially going to have problems with these drugs. The physician is going to go home and go to sleep, you know? So I, I think that all of us, um, being more educated and not, you know, not just handing our fate over to a, an overworked physician um, is a good thing, no matter what the drug is. Let me let me also follow up on one other point that uh, the, the from the comment that was made, uh, and this also came from the commander of the SWAT officers. They 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 make this point about this fact that they're very the heroin uh, abuser, no problem talking about it, which seems to almost be counterintuitive because so much stigma is attached to this stuff. Is that something that, that you saw, at least I, I saw several examples in, your, in the reporting that you've done of, of case examples. Was it easy in terms of folks opening up about this? Yeah, it is, and I think it's getting easier. Um, the New York Times did a really great, smart story about a change in the last year or so and how people in, in the obituaries, people are writing for their loved ones who have overdosed. And they're not saying anymore, died quietly and peacefully at home. They're saying died from heroin, you know, because uh, they want, the they, they feel more comfortable because there's such a problem in their community and they want their loved one's death to, um, to serve as a warning to peers, to classmates, whatever, about the dangers. Uh, and I, I'm, I talk to people all the time who said, you know, when my daughter or son died, I felt so ashamed. But in the months or years after that, I realized that I wasn't alone at all. And now I'm speaking publicly for this or that reason. When it comes to the actual addicts, I mean, being addicted to heroin is hell. I mean, it's just, it's terrible. It, I mean, there's not much of a high after the beginning. It's, it, people are using drugs to avoid withdrawal. Um, using them just brings you up to a normal everyday life. It's, it's terrible. And for the opioid uh, crisis has hit a lot of people who were, grew up in middle class and upper class families who were professionals or the children of professionals. Um, as we discussed, there's a racial aspect to it. And I think many people who find themselves to be intravenous heroin uh, users cannot believe that this is their life. And they do want to explain it to somebody to say, I am a regular person. This is how I ended up here. I'm, I'm not a junkie. This is how I ended up here. Um, yeah, I, I find them very forthcoming. Chris, same, same in, uh, at least in the experiences that you've had? Forthcoming? Because uh, I, I almost find it like I always uh, made an assumption sometimes that when people are, are forthcoming, it's like a step uh, towards uh, kind of dealing with it. Is that something that you? Yeah, I think uh, they are forthcoming. Obviously, there's some that you could tell that they're, you know, they're not. Um, and I think a unique perspective when we see these patients in the hospital, a lot of times it's because of an abscess and they need to get it drained in. There's a lot of pain. Obviously, what some patients don't realize about being addicted to heroin is that once you're addicted to heroin, pain medications, opioids obviously no longer work for you, right? And so there's really not much else for the acute pain. Obviously, there's other medications, but, but they're really uh, kind of suffering. So I think one of the reasons why they're probably kind of open about it is because they know that they'll probably require higher doses of IV pain medications, right? Which is kind of, well, that's kind of weird. So then we're going to give you the, the medication that you are addicted on because it's a pain medication, of course, right? And so that's what's, uh, what's kind of interesting you know, about that. Uh, as far as patients, you know, kind of admitting to the, and I think the problem, right, obviously I'm not an addiction specialist, but, sure. you know, right, everybody chases that first high, right? And as Harriet mentioned, a lot of times these addicts aren't taking it to get high anymore. They're just doing it to function, kind of like my, me and my coffee, right? I don't, I don't do it to get a buzz. I do it so I don't withdraw from caffeine and don't get a bad caffeine headache. Kind of, you know, but obviously caffeine opioids are both drugs, right? And so, you know, I kind of make that, uh, analogy to patients too, right? When you first had coffee, right, it kind of really gave you a good buzz and it helped, but now you use it all the time, your body's used to it, then you just kind of do it just to drink coffee, right? Same thing with these heroin addicts. A lot of times they're not taking to get high, they're just doing it just so they don't feel miserable. They just take it just to feel like you and I are feeling right now, right, without anything, right? 
Greg, last question. Um, well, you've all covered this really well, and I appreciate your comments and your expertise. Uh, the comment that I had earlier up on the screen, I just want to elaborate that um, I think the carpet's good. I just think that the carpet should have all of the players on it, and you brought that up. Uh, physicians being called to the carpet, great. I mean, whether it's for billing, prescribing, whatever, we all have a responsibility and a code to live up to. Um, so, and, and the, the comment about direct marketing, I, I put that on there is because there's not a day that goes by that you don't see. I saw something the other day for non-small cell lung cancer marketing ad. Now you've, you don't necessarily see the opiates, but you see a constipated colon from opiates on TV, uh, which is interesting. So, um, I mean, that's a piece that should be on the carpet too. But I was wondering a short comment on access and resources for recovery. Uh, it seems like we have this huge swell on one end, but um, people that want to find places or wh uh, where to go for recovery, it's either something on TV with bright lights and swimming pools, or it's something that's just bare bones. And I think that that is an area that needs to be addressed too. Greg, I, I, Harry, I don't know if you want to make a comment uh, to that regarding to those uh, areas uh, or places for treatment in general. I think we're going to see a, a big shift in the coming years, we're already seeing it, where uh, medically assisted treatment, suboxone, buprenorphine, is, is going to come to predominate. Um, it's easier to do studies on its efficacy. You know, every rehab's a little bit different and they're not really studied that closely anyway about whether they work or not. Um, buprenorphine's easier to look at the results, you know, um, and I think that it's gonna be cheaper for insurance companies, and so they're gonna like it, and they're gonna want people to embrace it. And I know a lot of really um, learned people in this field just say you cannot argue with the results. People don't relapse as much, and with, um, with opioid addiction, it's really common to meet people that have been to rehab five, six, seven, 12 times, um, because go, going cold turkey is just really, really difficult. And people will have withdrawal symptoms for, I mean, literally, like you can go be going through withdrawal to some degree for years, having kind of those um, subacute withdrawals. And so I'm really interested in what's gonna happen with buprenorphine. And I think that our government is really pushing it. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna see, we're gonna see if that's uh, part of the solution. All right, thank you. I, I want to thank every, uh, I want to uh, first uh, thank uh, Harriet Ryan for kindly giving us an hour of her time uh, in LA for her perspective. Uh, you can catch her uh, amazing uh, reporting for the LA Times. She has several articles. They are very compelling reads. Uh, so uh, a big fan. I want to thank Harriet for, for her perspective uh, this evening. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Christopher Wee, uh, who is at Mayo Clinic Arizona in the Pain Rehab Center, uh, and also to the wonderful folks here at the Cronkite School for giving us this forum. Uh, a big problem, so much that needs to be done. I, I just appreciate uh, tonight's conversation and everyone's attention. Uh, and a reminder and a plug that we have one more this year uh, in April. We are going to look at cancer breakthroughs with uh, with Dr. Michelle Halyard uh, uh, from Mayo Clinic in Arizona and also uh, Gina Collada from uh, the New York Times uh, who's going to help us kind of explore that topic uh, as well. And that's uh, early April. So I want to thank everyone for their attention tonight. Uh, and again, thanks to our wonderful guests. Uh, until the next time, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.